I'm a research fellow at the Max Planck Institute um, in Germany, currently very thankful uh, visitor here at the um, um, Alan Turing Institute, where I'm learning heaps. Um, but since I'm really from Germany, uh, we are not used to this kind of snazzy TEDx presentations, so I need the manuscript, if that's okay. Let me quickly put this here, if I can. Yeah, I think, thank you, Rob. I think that my uh, presentation kind of um, follows, follows on well, uh, quite nicely from Jonathan's uh, talk. I'm trying to um, look at the way that um, these kind of participatory processes have been used in the field of um, constitution making, so, so translated onto the national level. So um, I will briefly sketch three case studies, Iceland, um, Mexico City and Chile, all of which employed digital technology in some form or another to foster digital um, engagement in constitution making. So I think that these these examples should um, illustrate some of the opportunities, but also the limits of public participation at this constitutional level. So why participation in constitution making? The first argument is a theoretical one. The source of a constitution, this does not work, so I'll use this here. The source of a constitution uh, is generally uh, recognized as to be the people. In a democratic society, everyone should have a say on all the rules they live under. And this, is applies, this also applies preeminently to the most fundamental rules. So practical spe practically speaking, this means that constitution making should be inclusive and involve as many citizens as possible. The second argument is that public participation in constitution making is assumed to make constitutional texts substantively better. Now, this is an argument that has gained traction <coughs> significantly over the last couple of years, namely that including a wide range of people allows constitution drafters to tap into the collective intelligence of the people. So put differently, the idea is to use crowds for idea generation. And the last argument is that participation in constitution making should help, help to form a we of a group of individuals. So ideally, more open, more inclusive, more transparent processes will foster a sense of ownership and legitimacy and thus ensure the stability of, um, uh, of democratic constitutional orders. And I think that in view of the global increase of societal polarization and fragmentation, the need for creating such a common base um, of values and principles in a society is becoming more and more important. So participation in constitution making makes a lot of sense in theory. But in fact, um, um, uh, this has, public participation is, is now generally and widely regarded as best practice. Some even consider uh, participation as a legal right um, in constitution making. But this has not always been the, that way. For most of history, constitution making has been reserved to lawyers and um, politicians, and the people assumed a largely passive role. Citizen participation in constitution making has been essentially hourglass shaped, just as, as I depicted it uh, here, with some participation at the beginning of the process, for, for example by electing representatives of a constitution drafting assembly, or at the end of the process uh, via a referendum. But the mere aggregation of votes does not do much in terms of idea generation. And it does not do much in terms of fostering meaningful deliberative reflection or the exchange of um, ideas on a societal level. So in the last 10 years or so, public participation in constitution making has been witnessing a number of democratic innovations that seek to widen the size and the waste of the hourglass by improving both the deliberative quality uh, and the scale of participation in constitution making. And many of these innovations take inspiration from the success of digital participation at the local level. But as I think it will become clear, constitution making is more complicated. And I think that they also didn't make use of all of the most recent innovations that exist at the moment. So technology has been employed to varying degrees and uh, at varying uh, different phases of constitutional reform over in over 15 countries. 
Um, but I think that in Iceland, Mexico City, and in Chile, technology played a particularly central role. And also, all of these cases concerned complete constitutional overhaul, and not just constitutional reform or amendment, which I think um, uh, is less or more challenging. Um, um, more challenging. So let's start with the with the first case, Iceland. So the Icelandic process combined three forms of public participation. Randomly selected deliberative fora at the idea generation phase, self-selected online participation uh, during the drafting phase, and a non-binding popular referendum at the ratifying state. The process was triggered by the Icelandic uh, financial crisis and the breakdown of the public's trust in its political class. And this mistrust against the politicians also characterized constitution making as politicians were largely excluded or completely excluded from the process. So the process was um, kicked off with a one day deliberative forum, the national forum, which brought together 950 randomly selected Icelanders to produce a set of core values and visions that were to serve as the basis of the constitutional text. And the outcomes of this national gathering were summarized by a group of experts in a report. And this was originally planned to be the only form of public participation in the, in the process. But the Constitutional Council, which was a group of 25 elected non-professional Icelanders, decided to create the process as transparent as possible and continue the, the debate with the public. So the council members decided to open up the drafting process to the public. And they did so by publishing work in, process, work in progress um, drafts on a dedicated platform, um, as well as uh, social media web uh, platforms, including Facebook, Twitter, Flickr, and YouTube. And what emerged was an, an iterative drafting process, if you will. In total, 12 versions of constitutional drafts were elaborated by means of a kind of a feedback loop between citizens and uh, the Constitutional Council. So, during this process, the Council received 311 proposals, substantive proposals, 3,600 comments from the public. Um, and while this doesn't seem a lot, um, this is an average of 130 proposals per 100,000 voters, which is much more than the celebrated participatory, uh, analog participatory processes of South Africa uh, or Brazil in the 1998 and 1994. But due to the ad hoc manner in which this input was solicited, there was no systematic data analysis process. But since the input was relatively small, constitutional drafters were able to personally respond to most queries, comments and suggestions. And ultimately, 29 or roughly 10% of the submissions ended up in the final constitutional text. And now while the high impact of this form of participation is remarkable, it also highlights the problem of self-selection in broad-scale participation. 77% of the submissions came from men, 80% of whom were between 40 and 65 years old. So other than in the deliberative forum, where the group was randomly selected and access was statistically equal, here participation of society, or certain parts of society, exerted significantly more influence on the process than others. So once the process drafting process was over, Icelanders approved the draft with a two-thirds um, with a two-thirds majority in a referendum. But the process ground to a halt in the parliament, which failed to ratify the constitutional draft in the end. And this was arguably, arguably due to the, one of the she, uh, key shortcomings of the Icelandic process, as the, the process alienated political elites who then were not um, uh, willing to support the constitutional change. So I think that despite the ultimate failure and the fact that Iceland's size and homogeneous socio-economic makeup is hardly comparable to other contexts, the Icelandic case um, still set new standards for public participation in constitution making. It showed how high quality deliberation and direct participation could be effectively sequenced and offered an unprecedented access of the public to a drafting of a constitutional text. But it also highlighted some of the some of the problems of the involvement um, of or the, some of the problems of self-selection and the need for the involvement of political actors in such processes. <laughs>
Now the next case is doesn't concern a state, but uh, a city, Mexico City. Um, and even though this is not technically a national process, I think that um, the size of the city's population make the case comparable to other national processes. And in Mexico City, the constitution-making process marked the transformation of the capital district of Mexico City into a federal state. And so policymakers here focused predominantly at the idea generation phase, um, combining different elements of participation and linking them to the work of the drafting body. And so the first step of this process was an online and offline survey which was used to stimulate interest in the process and creative thinking um, uh, about the citizens' relationship with the city. A total of 26,000 um, residents from 1,400 neighborhoods uh, completed the survey. But the interesting thing is that after completing the survey, each respondent received a unique identifier which allowed them to link their answers with specific provisions in the draft constitutional text which was addressing this input. So I think that this was, this was an, an interesting method for fostering and sustaining uh, public's interest in the process. Now for the second element um, of citizen engagement, policymakers teamed up with uh, change.org to solicit substantive input in the constitution. And so the process was basically a, a petitioning system setting particular thresholds. 5,000 signatures meant that the submission would be sent to the drafting committee's legal experts for review. With 10,000 signatures or more, petitioners would be invited to present their ideas at the drafting committee. And 50,000 signatures or more meant an audience with the mayor. And this basically allowed citizens to, substantive, um, to, to voice substantive ideas via topical representatives. And at the same time, it kept public participation and the input manageable for drafters. The drawbacks, though, of this method was that it had no particular um, deliberative quality. Uh, Change.org presents um, choices as binary, so there's little room for more nuanced exchange of arguments or debate, and the competitive or, or viral, if you, if you will, uh, format meant that many less popular uh, proposals did not get seen. So nevertheless, I think that the simple method, method was accessible, well-received, and, and, and effective. By the end of the process, more than 400,000, I already put it up, more than 400,000 um, users viewed the proposals and 280,000 people signed on 341 different petitions. And also, the petitions that serve all the petitions that surpassed the 10,000 uh, signature threshold were finally incorporated into the constitutional draft. And the constitution now entails 14 articles based on citizen petitions generated via the change.org um, platform. Um, so although the process itself, the drafting process itself, was pretty tightly governed by political elites, this did not frustrate uh, public input, probably because public input was relatively, had gained quite a lot of political weight already. So let's move on to the last case, and I think the most interesting, if most complicated case, Chile. So Chile tried in some ways to square the circle by attempting to combine deliberation and mass participation. The constitution-making process was an executive initiative, which President Bachelet at the time uh, launched as a response to long-simmering demands for constitutional change. Since the process was initiated by the executive, um, and there was no broad political consensus on the need for constitutional change, um, the president's office thought that it would be good to create a participatory process to garner public momentum for the cause. So the first phase of the process was an online survey which generated more than 90,000 um, responses. The second step was a bottom-up deliberative, de deliberative process starting at the, at, with deliberative assemblies at the local levels called cabildos. These were self-convened local meetings composed of 10 to 30 uh, people and at the end of the day, more than 8,000 of these meetings were held with more than 100,000 participants. Um, <coughs> excuse me. At the next step, you have um, meetings um, at, the, at the municipal level and uh, the, the regional level. 
And at the end of the whole process, 218,000 people participated in this process. Each, now this is the complicated part, each deliberative stage was organized around four constitutional themes, namely values and principles, rights, duties, and um, institutions. And each of these themes now entailed a list of preconceived concepts. So in the list of institutions, you would have something like the judiciary, for instance. And um, now in the first step, participants were asked to choose seven of these preconceived uh, principles and rank them in importance. And participants also had the option of adding new concepts to the list that the organizers had already put on there. And in, the, in, in addition to this ranking of the concepts, participants were asked to write a short argument explaining why each chosen principle was important for the Constitution. Now the result of this, um, of this uh, process was that all of these results were then uploaded onto, onto an online platform feeding into a consolidated database. Now the deliberative goal of the process was to get the people talking about constitutional issues. And the participatory goal of the process was to use these sources of data, um, the ranking and the arguments, to produce a body of core constitutional concepts, ideas, ideas fuerza, what they called them, to guide the constitution drafting. And now, although there is no official data on this, judging from the interviews that I, that I held um, with participants, the, li the, the deliberative aspect was a huge success. The constitution eventually became a national debate and even those against constitutional re reform felt that it was a useful exercise. At the same time, the process suffered less from the self-selection bias of other mass participation processes. But the key challenge was the analysis of the data, not only because the analysis of the process was something that the organizers of this process, uh, of, the, of the participation process, did not think about beforehand. So it was done in a very ad, on an ad hoc basis in a very short time frame. And I think that I have a very short time frame too, so I'll skip the, the, the way that they actually analyzed the, the data. So in any case, the drafting process um, then uh, was held behind closed doors, um, and this arguably sucked out the life of, of this participatory um, effort. And while, while the draft reflected some of the ideas raised during the, the participatory process, it is unclear how the appointed ex experts accounted for the uh, public input. And this lack of transparency in the analysis of the public data and of the ultimate drafting of the process alienated both the public who were not able to clearly trace their input in the constitution and the politicians who felt that public participation and the drafting of the process itself was an act of political maneuvering of the executive. So ultimately the draft was not, uh, the constitution was not adopted as Bachelet's uh, successor, uh, Piñera, won the presidential elections and shelved the document. But the story is not over because, um, as you might have heard, um, there were some uprisings last October. One of the key demands of the protesters was n a new constitution. And they spontaneously set up these cabildos, again, that were used in the constitution-making process, these uh, back in, in that constitution-making process, to think about how to solve the crisis. And in March, you know, in April, they will um, vote on whether or not to hold a new constitution-making process. I think they will. It will be interesting. So very quickly, a couple of observations, incomplete observations, which I think will uh, may serve as talking points for the discussion. <laughs> so participation matters, or does it? Public participation processes appear to have an impact on text. A superficial analysis suggests that participation did indeed bring about new and innovative constitutional ideas which found their ways into the constitutional text. So if our normative standpoint is that better text means more sophisticated, more liberal, more progressive norms, then constitutional text did become better. What is less clear is whether participation also helps to foster ownership, creating a common base of values and principles possibly a sense of community. But arguably such societal impact is, is harder to measure, could be achieved possibly through some kind of a debrief after a constitution-making process through surveys or polling. The second point is quantity matters. 
and quality too. So as we have seen, different forms of public participation fulfill different requirements for participation in constitution making. Mass participation is, uh, works well, well for broad scale inclusion and the ide on for idea generation, but it relies on self-selection and the deliberative quality is relatively low. <coughs> deliberative fora foster mutual understanding and reflection and are well suited for questions that address value-based issues, but by themselves they do not account for the importance of mass participation as a as an essential step for the validation of a constitutional draft. So these examples though have shown how policymakers can make use of both elements in meaningful ways, either by sequencing different forms of participation or by combining it as in Chile. <coughs> but creating a working relationship between these two is tricky and policymakers will have to think very carefully about which form of participation to use at which stages and how to integrate them holistically in the process for them to have an impact. Constitution making, uh, participation does not matter all the time. So in all cases, public input tends to concentrate on rights provisions. And they have less of an impact on norms that govern questions of institutional design. So unlike rights norms that you can basically just add into a constitutional document, um, questions concerning institutional design are highly technical. So if you change one aspect of the political organization, this will have trickle down effects on other norms of the constitution. If you change the electoral system, you will need to make adjust, uh, adjustments to the institutional design as well. And public input in both uh, deliberation and mass participation was in no case nuanced enough to offer workable solutions that would um, allow for a constitutional system to function in predictable ways. And related to that, elites matter. Um, norms concerning the institutional design, the political aspects of a constitution, um, they are always political and competitive in nature. If you have a decision between a parliamentary and a presidential system, this is a binary decision and this will need to be negotiated. There's, there's a, they, ha they carry a great importance for the distribution of political power and they will require political bargains and trade-offs to get agreement on the constitution among members of the political elite. So closed door negotiations will probably still be necessary for agreements to struck to be struck. Finally, context always matters. Constitutions are never written on a blank canvas, but they are always embedded in some pre-existing um, political institutional framework. So for democratic <coughs> innovations to, 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 to work, policymakers will have to ensure the effective collaboration between crowds and existing representative institutions which may mean that we have to temper some of our enthusiasm for these tools as much as we love them. So I think that what, what has become uh, clear is that constitutions are a slightly different animal to local and ordinary lawmaking processes and, uh, and require different forms, not just scaled up versions of what works for a town and a neighborhood. I think. And I think that because of this complexity, participation needs to be nuanced, targeted and, and targeted and holistically planned. All things that nearly never happen in constitution making. So good luck. <laughs>